Hello friends, day 208 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. Today we are in Isaiah chapters 44 through 48. So a lot more information coming at you, but all wonderful stuff, great stuff. We've got some good heart checks today. So before we get started, if you are new here, welcome. We have got 207 days of content for you on this channel. <laughs> so if you want to get a good foundation and a good understanding of the Bible, I suggest going back to day one, but we are happy to have you here at day 208 and welcome you to stay. And you will still get a lot from this. The Lord will meet you where you're at as you seek him, uh, whatever time it is in your journey. So if you could help us out, if you're not new, by liking this video, that is kind of your contribution, your giving back to this, if this Bible study has blessed your life. Also, if you could subscribe to the channel and make sure you hit the notification bell because my videos do not come out at the same time each day. <laughs> and sometimes they don't even come out during the day they're supposed to. So that way you'll know when the videos drop. And also make sure you're in our Facebook group because we have got people working hard over there. Monica is uploading the documents of the notes, even though the notes are in the description box. Some people are having a hard time accessing them, so you can find those on our Facebook page. Also, if you need to contact me, all that info in the description box, as well as some additional information about this Bible study and additional sources that might help you as you study through the Bible. So before we get started, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. Our Father who art in heaven, you are so good to us. You are holy. You are God almighty. You are our healer, our provider. You are the one who fights our battles. We are so grateful that we are continuing to learn more and more about you each and every day. And so I pray, Lord, that you will reveal more of yourself to you. We pray for an outpouring of your spirit today upon each and every one of us who are here diligently seeking you. And Lord, your word says that you give favor to those who diligently seek you. You reward those who diligently seek you. So that is what we're doing here as we desire and thirst for more of you, God. And I just thank you so much for the old things that you have done, that you've spoken and the new that is still yet to come. Lord, as you go from old to new, it's always from glory to glory. It's always better and better. And so we are just grateful as as we look ahead, that even though this world seems dim and grim, you are not, Lord. You are bright. You are the light of the world. You give us so much hope for the future, and especially as we look ahead to heaven and to eternity. So I pray that you will please clear out our minds, clear out our hearts, God, of anything that is keeping us from being able to hear your voice, to see your face, and to be able to receive your word in such a way that it gets down deep into our spirit and brings forth fruit. I pray that that happens today as we are reading. Lord, let it all be for your glory, though. Let it not just be about our own selfish desires, but ultimately as we lay everything down, our own lives down, back onto the altar, Lord. May you be blessed by it. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we went or left off with God pronouncing judgment, and now we're looking ahead to the promise of hope and restoration for Israel. Verse 1, chapter 44. But now hear, Jacob, my servant. So when he's saying now hear, this is an urgent call for them to hear. He starts off by calling him Jacob and then saying, Israel, whom I have chosen. So that old to the new. He goes from deceiver to governed by God. Thus says the Lord. So he authored it all. The fact that Isaiah is declaring this is what the Lord is saying. Thus says the Lord who made you. So God very active in his creation. He doesn't just form us and then let us go. He is still active each and every day for every person who walks this earth and for all of creation who formed you from the womb and will continue to help you. So fear not, O oh Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. So this is a new name for Israel. This means upright one or righteous nation. This name is only mentioned four times in the Bible. And so again, kind of declaring the other side, the other face of Israel, first Jacob and now upright one or righteous nation. For I will pour water on the thirsty land. And streams on the dry ground, I will pour out my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So God wants to pour out upon his children. So when we stop here first on pouring water on thirsty land, 
Well, let's start with a heart check here. How thirsty are you? Are you thirsting for more of him? Do you desire for his spirit to pour out more into your life? Are you truly hungering after him? Well, how do we know if we're truly hungering or thirsting after him? And how do we become more hungry in that case or more thirsty? Well, I guess we could say we need to stop eating junk food. If you think about when your parents used to say, don't ruin your dinner, put the chips away. It's because we might be feeding on too much junk so that we are no longer hungering for the word and the actual nourishing that our soul needs. We can start pouring out. We might be too full on the word and because we're not releasing it and pouring it out into others through ministry, through encouragement, through helping other people, well, we're going to be so full on ourselves as consumers that we will actually not hunger and not thirst after the word. And then we can receive it in faith. So when the Lord does actually pour it out, we receive it. It is his desire to do this. And then when he talks about pouring out his spirit, well, Moses prayed for that. He prayed for the spirit to be poured out in numbers. And then the prophets talked about it specifically in Joel chapter two, about how his spirit would be poured out. And of course, Jesus fulfilled it. Jesus came to the earth, he died, and then his spirit was poured out onto his church, onto the people in the upper room, into his disciples. And that's when the church began. And of course, he will pour out his spirit upon all of mankind once again at the end of the tribulation. And they shall spring up among the grass. So when he pours out, that waters the soil so that there can be fruitfulness, so that there can be an outshooting from among the grass. Like willows by flowing streams, this one will say, I am the Lord. Another one will call on the name of Jacob and another will write on his hand the Lord's and name himself by the name of Israel. So essentially, when this happens, when the Lord pours out his spirit, it is our identification. This is our ID badge that we wear. He has given you the Holy Spirit. When you received Jesus, the Spirit of God now lives in you. That is your identification. That's your new identity. So heart check, do you wear your ID badge and do you wear it proudly? Or are you still hiding behind, skirting between, well, I go to church. I mean, yeah, I'm Christian, but I still do this, 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 and this. Or are you really thirsting after that righteousness? Are you really trying to walk down that road of holiness. Now, it doesn't mean you won't fall, but are you making an excuse? Like, I'm wearing this badge, but I still am kind of walking the line on the other side. And when he declares here that his name is the name of Israel, that means he has gone from being the worm of Jacob to now being the men of Israel. Verse six, thus says the Lord, King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. So he is the first and the last. Everything else has to be created. He didn't have to be created. He was already here in the beginning and he will be here in the end. See, where everything else, all creation, all things on the earth and in the universe had to be created in the beginning and will eventually die. It will eventually wear out but God doesn't. And Jesus declares in Revelation 1 verse 8 that he is the first and the last. So this is pointing to the fact that Jesus is God. He was there in the beginning and he'll be there in the end. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. So really, can anybody else truly declare, has anyone else spoken of something that was going to happen and it came to pass the way that I do? All of these promises, these thousands of promises that God has spoken in his word, most of them have come to pass, right? And no one else has ever been able to do that. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from the of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? No, there is no rock. I know not any. So when we truly know God, when we truly know him in all of his nature, all fear has to go away. That is why he tells us so many times, fear not, Do not be afraid when I am with you and when you know that I'm with you and you know what I'm capable of and who I am. 
I am the I am. I'm everything you need. There's no room for fear. We can no longer fear. Now, that doesn't mean we won't be scared because <laughs> trust me, I got a whole lot of fears in my life and I'm still scared of certain things. But that just overwhelming fear that once was can no longer be in existence when you have an overwhelming faith that wells up within you in the spirit of God. Now we're talking about the folly of idolatry, the foolishness of idolatry spoken in sort of a satirical way, satire or sarcasm. All who fashion idols are nothing and the things they delight in don't profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. Who fashions a God or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified. They shall be put to shame together. So where we were talking about there can be no fear with God. Well, with idols, there's all types of fear, especially when God rains down his judgment, because these gods and these idols will not be able to protect them. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and he works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with a strong arm. And then he becomes hungry and his strength fails. So this is showing the weakness and the frailty of the ones who create these idols or humans. He drinks no water and is faint. And then the carpenter stretches out a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into a figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. And then he cuts down cedars, or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak, so the strongest of the wood, and he lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar, and the rain nourishes it, and then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes part of it and warms himself, and he kindles a fire and breaks, bakes bread. Half of it he burns in the fire, and over half he eats meat over the other half. He roasts it and he is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it, he makes into a god, his idol. And then he falls down and worships it. He prays to it and he says, deliver me for you are my God. So in other words, he's basically hopeless at this point. The fact that he has to bow down to this God, he's like, please help me. He's calling out to them, right? But we know they're worthless. We know they can't help. So they know not, nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes. So basically, God has given them over to their own will and what they desire to I, you know, worship their own idols so that they cannot see in their hearts so that they cannot understand. So God is not physically shutting their eyes or physically making their hearts hard, but he knows that they are going to shut their eyes themselves to being able to see God and they are going to harden their own hearts so that they cannot understand him. So he's basically letting it happen because he doesn't want to force anyone. No one considers nor is there knowledge or discernment to say half of it I burned in the fire. I also baked bread on its coals and I roasted meat and have eaten. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes A deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? So knowing that he feeds on ashes, this is saying that there's only emptiness. When he worships this idol, he gets nothing from it. Very different from what it is like whenever we feed on the word of God. We are full. Whenever we are thirsting or hungering after God, he fills us and he satisfies. Only feeding on the word or coming to the Lord in prayer, because of course, you know, the word is the Lord. The Lord is the word. Jesus is the word made flesh. So when we feed on the word or on the bread of life, that is the only thing that will truly satisfy So remember these things, O Jacob, and Israel, for you are my servant. So now he's going to give them, here are the reasons that you can trust me. Remember, I formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. How can we not trust him if he tells us, I will never forget you? I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like a mist. So basically the work has been done. There's total forgiveness. The debt has been paid. Is that not a reason to trust the Lord? Return to me, for I have redeemed you. 
Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. So this should be our response to the fact that he has done the work, he's paid the debt, he's totally forgiven us. This should be our response that all creation praises and submits to him. Shout, O depths of the earth. So basically, all creation does. All creation is submitted before the Lord, except for us, <laughs> except for the humans. We're the only ones who are truly stubborn. O forest and every tree in it, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Thus says the Lord, your redeemer, or your defender, your protector, and the one who buys you at a price, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things. So he is the creator of all, each and every person, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners. So liars are those who are wise in their own eyes and also the diviners. And these, of course, are not things of the Lord. And this just proclaims, you know, he is wiser than all. He will make them foolish and he will frustrate those who lie. He turns back wise men and makes their knowledge foolish. He confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers. Who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited and of the cities of Judah, they shall be built and I will raise up their ruins. Who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Now, shepherds, a lot of the time when we see this word, we automatically think of Jesus or we think of pastors or those types of leadership. Well, Cyrus is not a godly man, even though God is going to use him in such a powerful way for Israel. But shepherd is also a term that was used to refer to kings. Kings were often called this because of the way that they protected their nations. And this is declaring that Cyrus will be born, and he is 200 years later in 538 BC, and he becomes the king of Persia, who then allows for the return of Israel as he delivers them from the hands of Babylon. So that is how Cyrus is going to fulfill all of God's purpose. Saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. And it is Cyrus who will declare this for Jerusalem. And now we see the continuation of this same prophecy here in chapter 45. So we are going to lay a little bit of groundwork here. Babylon is a highly fortified nation. It was built around the Euphrates. The Euphrates River runs right through it, which means they've got all of the source and the resource that they need should they be attacked. They have 270 watchtowers. They've got a 20-year supply of food. And they basically thought that they were invincible. But as I always say, and as the word of God says, but God, and someone was asking the other day, what, what is this? You guys are all talking about, but God, because a lot of the time in prophecy or in scripture, it will say all of these things are happening, but God, and then it continues on about what God did. And that's why it's like, I'm going to walk around all day saying, but God, like somebody tells me, oh my gosh, look at this post. Look at what's going on in the world. Look at the, what the government's doing. I'm just going to sit there and say, but God. <laughs> like that's going to be my response because he can do anything. He can thwart any plan. His purposes are set in stone and no one can thwart that. Not even us, you know, like we think we've screwed up our lives so bad, but we are not strong enough to screw up our lives so bad. We cannot do that as long as we are seeking after the Lord. So uh, thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus. Like what? Cyrus is anointed? Well, remember that kings were anointed. They were appointed. That's basically what this anointing is talking about, how Cyrus will be appointed to this kingship of Persia so that he can be used as an instrument for the Lord's doing. Whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings. So he's basically naming the Redeemer of Israel, which is Cyrus. In Daniel 5, we'll see these things start to happen. To open doors before him, the gates may not be closed. Now these doors and these gates of Babylon weren't closed to him when they came upon them. I will go before you. So the Lord is saying, I am the one who's going to do this. I'm going to go out before you. You're going to follow behind and carry out the work. And that's what he does. He goes before us. We walk behind him and carry out his work. 
and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze. And there's like a hundred of those and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. So basically, Cyrus will know that it is the Lord. However, he won't know the Lord personally. He's simply only going to know that God's hand was upon what he did. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen. So this is God's why. It isn't because of their might, their righteousness, nothing. It is simply for the sake of Jerusalem, or sorry, by, for Israel and Jacob. This is why he calls Cyrus. I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. So again, Cyrus doesn't know him, even though he is called. So we can be called and not truly know the Lord. Verse five, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. So he is doing this. He is giving Cyrus everything he needs so that everyone everywhere can know that he is the Lord. And this is fulfilled in Ezra chapter one, verses one through three, where Cyrus acknowledges that, okay, you know what? God did this. And God is declaring that he is sovereign over all. He is sovereign over good. He is sovereign over evil. He is sovereign over the light. He is sovereign over dark. So let's look at the life of Cyrus here. He was anointed, chosen, rewarded, called, guided, blessed, used and equipped. Can you imagine being called all these things and still not knowing the Lord? How can that be? One would say, but it happens all the time. So many people are anointed, chosen, rewarded, called, guided, blessed, used and equipped by God. Yet they still don't truly know him because they are simply living out their works, but not in their heart. So our heart is always what matters. Our heart is always what God is after. I form light and I create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all things. So there is no opposite of God. He is the only one. Because the pagans truly believed that when you have like a God of darkness, you would also have a God of light. Or if you have a God of the mountains, you would have a God of the sea. They believed that there were opposite deities. But God is not like that. Satan is not the opposite of God. He is so much smaller compared to who God is in all of his wickedness. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open, that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. So this is what we need if we want to bear fruit. We need to be saved, one, but also be walking in righteousness. These two things go together. They are synonymous. They spring up together. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. So woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. So woe to those who are creating idolatry and following after them. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Can you imagine like a clay, the the soft clay in the potter's hands and the clay suddenly like gets a mouth and nose and eyes and looks up at the potter and is like, what are you making? <laughs> like that's the picture we got going on here. Or your work has no handles. So basically, he's talking about those who argue against God. Anytime we ever question what God is doing, argue against him, we are essentially telling him that what he is doing is second best to what we believe is best. It's basically saying, you're not doing a good enough job. You're not doing what I deserve. You're not giving me what I deserve. So that was a big old heart check right there. I wanted to ask... Do you ever feel like you deserve more from God? Like, I deserve this. I have done this. I have shown up. Why aren't you giving me this in return? Do you ever feel like you deserve things from people? And do you truly deserve things from people? You need to give this to me because I have done this for you. Do you live out your life in that way where you feel as though you deserve things from God and from people? And if we do, we're essentially calling God a liar by saying that you are not giving me exceedingly and abundantly above anything I could have ever asked for or thought of or imagined. So 
got to be careful about when we try to dictate (laughs) what God needs to be doing in our lives. We can ask, by all means ask, you know, but always, Lord, your will be done, not my own. So thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and the one who formed him, ask me of things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? I made the earth and I created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens and I commanded all their host. I have stirred him up in righteousness. So we're talking about Cyrus here. And I will make all his ways level. So basically, I'm going to make a way for him to do what I need him to do. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward. So even though Cyrus will actually be rewarded, this isn't why he's doing it. He is doing this out of a conviction and a command from God. So not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Now we're going to see a prophecy of the worldwide salvation that will take place through Jesus. Thus says the Lord, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabaeans, men of stature, shall come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down to you. So the fact that they're going to bow down to Israel ultimately means that they will bow down to God himself. They will plead with you saying, surely God is in you and there's no other, no God besides him. Truly, you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Now, how does he hide himself? He hides himself in his wrath while also revealing himself through his word. All of them are put to shame and confounded. The makers of idols go in confusion together. So idolaters will be shamed. And then we see, but Israel is saved by the Lord. So idolaters shamed, Israel saved. With everlasting salvation, you shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. What an amazing promise of hope for Israel here. Because I think a lot of the time when we are walking out our sin, one of the greatest fears is the shame that we will feel if we get caught. I know that was one of the greatest things that would somewhat convict my heart when I was walking in sin is, oh man, I can't do this because if if people find out, you know, that X, Y, and Z is going to happen and I don't want that to happen. I wasn't more concerned about dishonoring God. I was more concerned about the shame I was going to feel because I had it in my mind that, well, God already knows, you know, so I've already, I've already done that. I've already hurt him. I'm now scared of what it's going to do to my life. I was being selfish. And ultimately, all sin is rooted in selfishness. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God, who formed the earth and made it. I mean, he established it. He did not create it empty. After all, he formed it to be inhabited. That's basically what those parentheses are doing, the way that I said that. It's like, by the way, I am the Lord and there is no other. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness, the way that pagan diviners do. They speak secretly. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. So in Jeremiah 29, it says that if we seek him, we will find him. Jesus says, if you ask, you will receive. I stand at the door and knock. If you open it, there I will be. It is never in vain when we seek after God. He will reward those who diligently seek him as spoken in Hebrews chapter 11. So good on you for being here today and for diligently seeking the Lord because he is the rewarder of those who do this. I, the Lord, speak the truth and I declare what is right. So he is not speaking blowing hot air the way that the idols do. He only speaks truth. His word is truth and right. It is all righteousness and it is out in the open he's not trying to be secretive here about the things that he speaks the way that we kind of do i mean we hold back you know someone asks us a question and we are sometimes often scared sometimes often that totally didn't make sense we are i would say oftentimes scared to speak the whole truth and the blatant truth it's a scary thing because one we don't want to dishonor god by pushing them away with the truth But that can't be our concern. Our concern is to speak the truth, to plant the seed in love now, not not in a judgmental way, but in love and allow God to then convict the heart, the Holy Spirit to do that work. You know, we can't be scared of pushing people away. Our job is to declare the good news. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, you survivors of the nations, so you remnants. 
They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a savior. There is none beside me. And so now we see this plan of salvation here. So turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. So he is calling out to every nation and it is all out of love. And this is showing his love to them and his assurance and the extent of his love that it isn't just, you know, in a bottle for Israel. No, it is for the entire earth, for all people. And what do we have to lose if we turn to him? We have nothing to lose when we turn to God, but what yet we have everything to gain. We gain eternity. We gain reward. We gain everlasting love. We gain healing. We gain peace. We gain righteousness. We can continue on and on of what we gain, everything we have to gain and nothing to lose when we turn to the Lord. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. His word never returns void. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. And of course, Paul reiterates this in Philippians chapter 2. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me are righteousness and strength. Nowhere else will you be able to get this. To him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. So anyone who has turned away from him and refuses to turn to him will have no share in the eternal kingdom. In the Lord all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. Chapter 46, now we see an indictment against idolatry. Bel bows down, Nebo stoops. So Bel means Lord, and this was the god of Marduk. And then Nebo was the god of science, learning, fate, writing, and wisdom. And this was known to be Marduk's son. Their idols are on beasts and livestock. So this is talking about the fact that when they had to move their idols, they had to do so uh, and transport them on animals because They're basically physical beings that really have no life. They can't move themselves. These things you carry are born as burdens on weary beasts. They stoop, they bow down together. They cannot save the burden, but themselves go into captivity. So this is a prophecy that all of the idols will be brought low. So listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel. You have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb, even to your old age. I am he. So this is showing God's never ceasing care. He cares for you from the time you're born all the way to the day that you die. This is declaring that fatherly care over his people. He will carry you. So heart check. Do you feel as though the Lord is carrying you? through this life? Or are you instead actually carrying a heavy load? Or are you carrying all of these burdens that should actually be cast upon the Lord? I have made and I will bear, I will carry and will save. So if he is declaring that promise for you today, let him carry you, let him carry your load. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? So remember, they actually used to fabricate gods according to what they wanted. So basically, if they're like, I want to soar high above all of the kingdoms of the world, they would make themselves like an eagle for an idol and worship that eagle, thinking that it would then manifest itself within them. But when we start to fabricate idols in our lives, we basically become enslaved by them. For instance, if we want pleasure and we su- we start to create an idol out of that pleasure where we start to seek after things and put them before God, it essentially turns into lust and we become enslaved by the lust. If we seek after money, if money becomes an idol, it then turns into greed and we become ensnared by the greed. So remember, these things aren't bad. Money's not bad. Pleasure is not bad. Those are two things God wants us to have. He wants us to have pleasure and prosperity. But where it becomes bad is the love of it, the love of pleasure and the love of money. That becomes the root of the evil or of the sin. So those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales, basically these things are costly and those are the idol makers. So those idol makers who are 
making these costly idols, hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god, then they fall down and worship. They lift it to their shoulders and they carry it. They set it in its place and it stands there. It cannot move from its place. If one cries out to it, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. So it's like, what's the point? These don't even work. These idols are worthless, especially in tragedy. So remember this, stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors or you unbelieving remnant. Remember the former things of old. So basically remember what I have done for you. You guys need to remember that my hand in the past should be what encourages you to seek me now in the present and for the future. Like all of the miracles that I did for you, how is that not a reminder of my power that is available you to available to you today and for the future? For I am God and there's no other. I am God and there's none like me. So the fact that he even repeated this is saying, hello, you all better listen. I am God and there's none like me. So stop worshiping other things that you think are like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. So God is not simply watching from heaven. You know, he's up there directing what is going on and what is going to happen. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all of my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, meaning Cyrus, and this is basically depicting his speedy and powerful conquest of Babylon. The man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. So listen to me, you stubborn of heart, you who are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It is not far off. So basically he's like, listen, it's going to happen sooner than you think. And my salvation will not delay. And of course it won't because God's timing is always perfect. It's always right on time. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory, regardless of whether or not Israel has rebelled, which we know she has. He's still going to save her for his glory. Chapter 47, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. So he's calling on Babylon now as the virgin daughter. Well, of course, this isn't according to her morality or her purity. He's calling her a virgin daughter because basically she's never been defeated by enemies before. So this is not a morality thing. And it's also a little bit of sarcasm as Babylon basically thinks that they're God's daughter. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no more be called tender and delicate. So you're basically going to go from prestige and honor to becoming a prisoner or a person of destruction. Take the millstones and grind flour, put off your veil, strip off your robe, uncover your legs, pass through the river. So this is speaking of the menial labor that they are now going to be put to. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. So you are going to be ashamed and your disgrace shall be seen. So they're going to lose all of their status and their privilege of being a superpower. I will take vengeance and I will spare no one. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, is the Holy One of Israel. So this is Isaiah declaring praise for what God is going to do. Sit in silence and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no more be called the mistress of kingdoms. I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage. I gave them into your hand and yet you showed them no mercy. So here is the guilt of Babylon. Not only were they proud and presumptuous thinking that they were, you know, they were not going to be able to be defeated, but they're also cruel and they don't show mercy. And this is so typical of humanity. You know, humanity demands mercy, but yet they also command judgment upon people because someone else's sin is always going to look a lot worse than your own. It's a lot easier for us to look at the other person's sin but not take a look at our insides. That's why Jesus, you know, had the story about the Samaritan woman and he had the story about taking the plank out of your own eye because he knows how hypocritical we are and how judgmental we are in our humanity. Now, therefore, hear this, you lover of pleasures who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me. I shall not sit as a widow or know the loss of children. These two things are actually going to come upon you in a moment and in one day, because of course, God will strike them down quickly through Cyrus's invasion. The loss of children and widowhood shall come upon you in full measure. So this is declaring a loss for their own future hope. 
in spite of your many sorceries and the great power of your enchantments. So despite your idolatry and your occult practices, you're going down. You felt secure in your wickedness. You said, oh, no one sees me. And this is what happens to hard-hearted sinners. Proud sinners think that they won't be found out. But the Bible says your sin will surely find you out. And this is also like atheists who don't feel like they see God in anything. So they don't believe in God because they don't simply want to. They, if they wanted to, if they wanted to seek God, they would be able to find him because those who seek him will find him. But they simply don't want to. So this is a hard heartedness. So we need to pray for people to see God because if they want to, then they will. And I have a lot of testimonies on this. Um, I used to kind of get into little friendly battles with friends. And I remember this always happening on the plane when I was a flight attendant. And it specifically happened with guys for some reason. I would be having sort of these friendly battles with them. They would be poking fun at me for being a church girl. And I would always tell them, I'm going to pray for you. I am going to pray that you have such a powerful encounter with God that you cannot deny him and you will turn to him. I assure you this. And I was so bold in my faith in that time. And I can tell you of countless times where those specific guys came to me years later or even within months and said, hey, you know what? Remember when we were talking about that? I'm actually going to church now. And I had a really good friend who became my friend because of that happening. And we started going to church together. We started surfing together. We became really, really great friends, a godly friendship. Um, and, and it was just, it started with that. So you just really never know. So praying for people to see God, to encounter God is powerful. So take that into account and start doing that and see what happens. You know, when people are so anti-God or ungodly, pray that they will see God because that, that in itself is all they need. They just need to see him. And I believe that that will be their turning point. All right, where am I? Your wisdom and your knowledge led you astray. And you said in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me, but evil shall come upon you. So that is what we don't want. We don't want evil to come upon people which you will not know how to charm away. Disaster will fall upon you for which you will not be able to atone. And ruin shall come upon you suddenly of which you know nothing. Stand fast in your enchantments and your many sorceries with which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps then you'll be able to succeed. Perhaps you may inspire terror. So this is kind of tongue in cheek here. You are wearied with your many counsels. Let them stand forth and save you. Those who divide the heavens, who gaze at the stars, which really they don't, right? Only God divides the heavens. Who at the new moons make known what shall come upon you, when really they don't. They don't tell of the future. Behold, they are like stubble. The fire consumes them. They cannot deliver themselves from the power of the flame. No coal for warming oneself as this. No fire to sit before. Such to you are those with whom you have labored. You have done business with you from your youth or who have done business with you from your youth. They wander about each in his own direction and there is no one to save you. So this is their final sobering judgment being spoken upon them. And they are going to feel destruction all around them. It's not only going to be in Babylon, but in every direction. And of course, from the time of this prophecy, Babylon falls 150 years later. Chapter 48. Now we see God's grace given to Israel once again. So hear this. So once again, this is an urgent appeal to a deaf nation. Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel. So from glory to glory and who came from the waters of Judah. Judah, this is not a compliment. We've got to remember that Judah himself was actually cruel. You can go back and look in Genesis chapter 37. He was also immoral in Genesis 38. So not a compliment to say you came from a sinner or an immoral person who swear by the name of the Lord and confess the God of Israel, but not in truth or right. So basically it's all appearance that you are swearing by my name and confessing my name because you are not walking in truth and righteousness for they call themselves after the holy city after Jerusalem, and stay themselves on the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts is his name. 
The former things I declared of old. So basically, I gave you evidence. They went out from my mouth and I announced them. And then suddenly I did them and they came to pass. So there was that evidence that I am who I said I am and I will do what I said I will do. Because I know that you are obstinate or you are hardened and your neck is an iron sinew and your forehead brass. So iron is referring to the fact that they are stiff necked, brass referring to the fact that they are hard headed. These two things are metaphors for their rebelliousness or their rebellion. I declare them to you from old before they came to pass. I announced them to you lest you should say my idol did that. No, because God did that. That's why he announced it first, which idols don't do. Idols cannot announce prophecy. My carved image and my metal image commanded them. That's what they are saying. But of course, that's not the case here. You have heard. Now see all of this. And will you not declare it? He's basically like, how are you still stubborn here? The fact that you've heard it all, you've seen it all. And how are you not now declaring that God is in this? From this time forth, I announce to you new things. And these new things to come are, of course, the appointment of Cyrus, the fall of Babylon, the return of Jesus, and the restoration of all things. This will all be fulfillment of the things that have been spoken. Hidden things that you have not known. They are created now, not long ago, before today. You've never heard of them. Lest you should say, behold, I knew those things. So basically, they would have said, of course, I knew this was going to happen. You have never heard, you have never known from of old, your ear has not been opened. For I knew that you would surely deal treacherously and that from before birth, you were called a rebel. So he is basically saying, listen, I know that your sin is so deeply rooted. It came from birth, you know, and that's the same case with us. We are born into this sin nature. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. So it's not because they deserved the mercy. Mercy is never deserved. It is because of his name's sake and for his own glory. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you through his judgment and the Babylonian captivity, but not as silver. And the reason why is because he tried to send the fire, but it did nothing to purify them. He basically found no silver. They didn't learn their lesson. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction or in suffering for my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. So this is for the integrity of his name. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. So listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel whom I called. So I love it how he keeps going from Jacob to Israel because it's like he's reminding them, I know who you are at the core I know who I created you to be. And that's what he says to us all the time. He looks at us for who we are created to be and for our potential. I am he, I am the first, and I am the last. My hand laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand forth together. So assemble all of you and listen. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. Of course, God is always motivated by love. Everything he does is from a heart of love. He shall perform his purpose on Babylon and his arms shall be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken and called him. And when he says he has spoken and called him, he is talking one about Cyrus, but ultimately about Jesus. I being God as the source of this prophecy. I have brought him and he will prosper in his way. So draw near to me and hear this. Now, Some scholars say this is actually Jesus speaking here. Draw near to me and hear this. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. So this is pointing to the fact that he is the Godhead, the three in one. This is looking to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as one in one. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments, because if you would have, you would have not had all of this untapped potential. I have taught you how to profit. I have led you in the way you should go. Then your peace would have been like a river. This river, meaning it's a metaphor as water that allows for growth and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. So your righteousness would have had all the power 
needed, necessary for anything and all things. It would have had constancy and it would have been for increase. Your offspring would have been like the sand. So you would have been as numerous as the sand. And this is looking back to the promise that he made to Abraham. And your descendants, like its grains, their name would never be cut off or destroyed from before me. Now, Satan's greatest lie is that God wants to condemn us in our sin and restrict us from living a full and abundant life. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God does not desire that for us. He speaks right here directly to us what he wants for us. He wants us to prosper. He wants us to do well. He wants to lead us. He wants to give us peace. He wants us to walk in righteousness because he knows that that is the best thing for us. Satan doesn't want the best thing for us, but God does. So go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea. So he's basically freeing them now. Declare this with a shout of joy and proclaim it. Send it out to all of the ends of the earth. So he's saying, declare these praises now. Leave the comforts of Babylon, the way he had to pull them out of Egypt because they were like comfortable in the life that they were living. And say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock and water gushed out. So they didn't thirst in the desert because he provided everything that they needed. He brought forth miracles so that they would have water. And here the Lord ends. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. I hope your heart is filled afresh. I hope that you are filled with the spirit, with that outpouring. There was so much meat in this. And my prayer is that you were able to receive it. My prayer is that you are now hungering for more, thirsting for more. So we thank you, Lord, for this fresh outpouring today. We thank you for the blessing of your word that never returns void. We thank you that we have a newness in you, that we are able to call you our father, our friend, our savior. We thank you that we have this special covenant with you, Lord. We thank you that we have access to you, Father, through Jesus, and that nothing that you do is ever in vain. Lord, we thank you that you do all the heavy lifting for us so that we don't have to, and that we are able to know you more and more as we seek your face. So Lord, as your timing is always perfect, your word has been spoken today, and I pray that it is received in this timely manner so that we are prepared for what is to come in the days ahead, and that you are working on the hearts of your people in the here and now so that when we walk into the future, God, we are a little bit stronger, we're walking a little bit taller, and we are walking with a bigger and bolder faith. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.